Hi, I'm Neil Hillman and uh, I own the audio suite here in Birmingham. We've got three mixing studios. This is the largest one that you're in here and it's the kind of result of a dream really, which is um, about making film, about making television programmes and, and mixing the very best possible sound that we possibly could. And so we've done our bit to build it in the hope that people will come. If you build it, they will come. I think it's important for us to try and embrace as wide a range of, of production budgets and, and production genre that we can. So really very, very humble indie filmmaking. You're very welcome at the Audio Suite. It's part of what we're doing with you. Well, right up to well-funded um, television drama, which we contribute to through ADR services, for instance. That's, that's something that we particularly do a lot of. Uh, and we've been very lucky to be used um, by certain artists for feature films. So, uh, for instance, Julie Christie came in and, and I replaced her entire dialogue for her role in um, New York, I Love You. So, so that, that was very exciting. Um, we've done stuff on Shameless, on Spooks, a, a whole host of things where we contribute to, to an overall package. And we have good relationships with sound editors and, and uh, supervising sound editors as well. So that, that works very well. And then in our own right, we do programmes in their entirety. Um, we're just finishing off an indie film now from Sheringham Studios called Money Kills, where we've done every single element of that. And, and that really has been a labour of love for them and for us as well. I mean, we've spent hours and hours creating it, but that's, that's what we, and I say we, I mean, that's the royal sort of sound we. Um, that's what we do. We're dedicated to supporting, to supporting pictures, and that's the joy of it. You know, it's, it's either heaven or hell, and for us, it's, it's heaven. That's what we do. I think that sound is, is, is perhaps above all else, uh, you know, arguably, what differentiates a film from being okay and takes it into great. Um, the eye sees better when the sound is great. It's a Steven Spielberg quote, and you know I like to trot that out. And, and I think that is, I think that is true. Um, we communicate with sound. We don't communicate with pictures, although communication does take place with pictures. But I think fundamentally, the way that we empathise with on-screen characters is the way that we hear them, and, and we hear them in, in, you know, plain language. And so I think everything has to start around. Um, the dialogue, the, the, the clarity of it. I'm very interested in this balance between effortless intelligibility and some of the worst examples that you could perhaps think of of a completely ADR'd film where it kind of bears no resemblance to what, you know, the lips are moving at the same time but actually they're not in the same room and it, it's, it's pretty shameful really and it's been just sort of trotted out by people who should know better. Um, so there's that, that fine balance that I'm always trying to achieve in the stuff that we do and frankly it doesn't matter whether we're doing, you know, a 40 part television series or whether we're doing a one-off indie film or whatever, that same commitment and the same values still hold good. We're trying to communicate a message. We're in a communications industry and frankly we're telling a story and how well can we tell a story and what emotion can we impart in there and as you can tell I'm pretty enthusiastic that sound plays a massive role in, in supporting the pictures um, and uncoupling the sound from the pictures can give a huge boost to the to, to, to sort of emotional content to, uh, of what you're doing. So it doesn't have to be slavish to the pictures. It doesn't have to be like a shadow to the pictures. And, and there's oh, there's a heap of stuff that we can talk about with that. I'm engaged at the moment in in a, in a PhD research in a, a PhD part time at. Uh, uh, the Department of Theatre, Film and Television at York. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautifully well put together um, um, establishment and, and so it's, it's a really interesting time to be doing this and doing it by practice. So taking those, those very theories that I'm trying to think, oh, is that unique or has somebody else done that? So trying to do something original um, and bringing it to bear on, on my work as well. And I was hugely influenced by a, a book called In the Blink of an Eye. It's written by Walter Murch, who, what can you say about Walter Murch? You know, he's, he's, he's a multiple Oscar winner for sound design. I think he's the only dual Oscar winner for picture editing and sound editing for The English Patient. And the emotion that he can put into something is, is, is amazing. So 
I'd got some pretty clear thoughts on, on how I would like to address one or two things. And I was just really cheeky and I, I wrote to him one day and very kindly, I mean, I, I eventually met uh, Mr. Murch in, in uh, Belgium at, at, at a film festival and I, I needed to go to see him because it was impossible not to, not to pick up on, on this opportunity to go and see him because he's, he's in Europe so, so rarely. So I actually jumped on my motorcycle and I, and I rode from here um, to the Ghent Film Festival. I was completely exhausted when I got there, but he was just, you know, sort of desperately seeking Walter. I was on a mission. It was very exciting, very exciting. I was very exhausted when I got there. But um, he was the most engaging and, and, and humble man to, to, to meet. And I, I, watched his, uh, I watched his talk, um, spent a, a whole day with him as, as he delivered his talk, and uh, I was lucky enough to have, have lunch with him and, he, and his wife. It was marvellous. Uh, and then the next morning, spent all morning with him. He, he very generously allocated all morning for me to just pester him with my questions, and he was most accommodating. And uh, I, I like to think that he's, he's just the same, even though he's, he's obviously, you know, much Oscared. Um, just the same as us, his love is about telling a story and the way in which you tell a story and doing it to the very best that you could possibly do. And it's kind of lifted the bar, really, because having met someone who might otherwise be very, very remote and you said, well, I'm never going to work on those kind of pictures, am I? Actually, his values are exactly the same as ours should be. And, and I like to think of what we do here. And, you know, now I've met, you know, Mr. Merch, I want to think, well, what would I think if he had to look at me doing this? You know, so it, truthfully, it doesn't matter what we're doing, whether it be a, a thirty-second television commercial or an indie film. We apply. We, you know, being the whole of the studios here, my, my two other engineers, we apply those same best practice principles. I think for for most folk who are working in a freelance capacity, it's a pretty cold environment. I think it can be very dispiriting. I think it can be very lonely. You've got to love what you're doing because you're kind of put to the test. And it's difficult to see whose fault it is because it's so, it's so far back. It's probably that time when I and my colleagues first went freelance that is that, you know, the people I work with now, they weren't even born then kind of thing, you know, it, it's, it's a good time ago, but that that that's that's come in of in in a reasonably uh, recent past that somehow it's not valued. What we do isn't valued. I've got some thoughts about um, there was a devaluing of sound as soon as camcorders came in. Um, when it was separate sound, then we were usually working on film. Film directors grew up with this being fifty percent of their products. It wasn't, it wasn't, oh, you know, he's a good director, he takes care of sound. That's what you did. It was 50% of your product. And then there became a generation of um, directors who hadn't really worked on anything but video. Uh, the media was cheap. By golly, if you'd gone out and shot a few rolls of film, you know, the development costs alone, you'd have been sacked. So you had to be very focused about what you were shooting. But the cheap media, tape media, gave rise to folks sort of hose piping, well shoot that, yeah, no, don't cut, let's just keep rolling, just keep rolling. And of course post-production costs spiral because you've got to edit all of that stuff, you've got to digitise it and, and what have you. So there's a, whole, there's a whole raft of things that you can do just by going back to basic principles as an indie filmmaker, for instance, that you can sort of slash costs really. And I kind, kind of quite like the purity of going back to, uh, to those days with digital SLRs, with, with, with this interview that we're doing here. We've got two cameras, we've, we've, we've synced them with a, with a clapperboard and that's kind of good, isn't it? That's just how we used to do it on, on film. So if we can encapsulate the good bits of, of what those craft skills were with the convenience of, of digital media now, then we really should be turning out some good stuff. We're standing on the shoulders of giants because if you think about the quality of what's gone before, what would they have done with the kit that we've got now? You know, it's just awesome. So really, we've got no excuse. Pay a great deal of attention to sound as an indie director. Really make it your friend. 
get to know it intimately, become its lover, let it become your mistress. Honestly, I can't emphasize it enough. It really is that important to you as a, as a filmmaker on a budget because it can make the difference between your film being saleable and it just being a heroic failure. That's a real shame. I think there's some craft rules and some tips and, and little basic things. There's plenty of resources around where you can where you can get those kind of things. Or try and find someone who can mentor you or can give you if you show interest, I'm I'm pretty sure that this is, is the same for cameras as, as as for sound. But if you show interest to a sound man, he'll spend all day telling you about it. And the more that you ask him that the more that because they're generally enthusiasts. But really, honestly, emphasising the point, you absolutely need to get a handle on sound and be able to control it because it will make the difference between you having a product at the end, you can sell and recover some costs and move on to another film, or you won't be taken seriously as a filmmaker. And I think that those things are not, uh, it's not about going and spending thousands and thousands of pounds. Um, every pound that you spend on location doing sound, I would say at least at least you will save £10 in post-production. So therefore, employ someone who is skilled and enthusiastic about the job that they're doing on sound. But all of this stuff needs to be chatted through at a script stage um, with the director. So get the, ideally get the sound post-production and production on board as soon as possible. As soon as you've got a shooting script, for instance, you really need to be talking with those. And that's a cup of coffee, you know, treat the guys to a cup of coffee somewhere and, and plan it. They will absolutely appreciate the professionalism. It's not, you know, I really honestly keep emphasising the question with gathering good sound is not purely financial. It's about treating the guys with respect, treating the medium with respect. <laughs> Break out here.